So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the 2021 UN South Asia Forum on Business and Human Rights. This is the session titled Occupational Health and Safety. I'm Adarsh from QDesign and I'll be your technical facilitator today. The Q&A function is on, so if you have any questions for the speaker, please use this function. Please note that the session today will be recorded. If you have any questions about Zoom or require technical assistance, please feel free to privately message through the Q&A box. I will now hand over to Okart to start the session. Adarsh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you uh, for, for all your assistance in, in getting us uh, started today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, a warm welcome to all of you, all the participants around the world to this session, as Adarsh mentioned, on occupational safety and health. My name is Okar Duper, and I'm the Global Program Manager of the Vision Zero Fund. Uh, just very briefly, the Vision Zero Fund is a G7 initiative. Um, it is administered by the ILO, by the International Labour Organization. And the goal of the Vision Zero Fund is zero fatal uh, or severe accidents, uh, injuries and diseases in global supply chains. Uh, our focus, the focus of the Vision Zero Fund is on least developed low income and low middle income countries. And we're currently active in eight countries uh, on three continents and working primarily in three supply chains, agriculture, garment and textiles. And uh, we've just started work recently in construction, another, as you know, highly hazardous sec sector. So the session, uh, before I, I introduce our speakers, I just want to make some uh, opening remarks. I think it is really a very uh, uh, important session. It is also a very timely one. Um, it's important because of this enormous challenge that we uh, face in terms of global uh, safety and health. Uh, as you know, probably know more than 7,500 people die each day from work-related injuries and illnesses. On an annual basis, this means that more than 2.7 million people die because they went to work to support themselves and their families. To put it more starkly, more than five people die due to their work every minute of every day around the world. Meaning that by the end of this session, close to 500 people would have died because of their job. Very importantly, we know that this burden, this tremendous burden that I've just described to you is not equally distributed around the world with more than 75% of global work-related deaths estimated to occur in Asia and Africa, which is why the session focusing on South Asia is so important. It is also not equally distributed amongst the workforce with those in precarious employment, workers in the informal uh, economy, or sector, those working in small and medium enterprises and work performed by groups subject to discrimination and marginalization, such as migrant workers, young workers, and racial and ethnic minorities most exposed to work-related injuries. We know that these numbers paint only a partial picture. And we also know that they are largely preventable. The event is also timely because the COVID-19 pandemic reminded us of the need to ensure decent work and sustainable and resilient business and the importance that a healthy workforce and safe workplaces have to these ends. The virus has placed the issue of occupational safety and health squarely on the international agenda. The pandemic reminded us of the essential importance of safety and health at work as a requirement for any business to operate resiliently, to avoid the unnecessary loss of life and health and the serious implications that ill health have for countries and societies at large. Now, securing safety and health at work is essential for sustainable business and protecting workers from accidents and diseases. Employers and workers in South Asia, especially the ones in micro and small enterprises and informal economy workplaces increasingly require practical and workable support measures to create safe and healthy working environments. We have to also address the needs of disadvantaged workers, some of which are, whom I've mentioned already, women, migrants, and also disabled workers. At national level, 
sound national policy in occupational safety and health is required for strengthening key national safety and health system elements, such as legal frameworks, labor inspectorates, training, or accident and disease reporting systems. ILO's Occupational Safety and Health Conventions provide very sound guidance in this regard. At the workplace level, and this is something I hope we can talk about today, robust dialogue between employers and workers need to be promoted for implementing practical safety and health improvement measures. We know where workers have a voice, where workers have the knowledge, those workplaces are generally safer. Now, the overall objective of today's session are to identify the key challenges and opportunities in South Asia on occupational safety and health as an integrated part of the business and human rights agenda to take stock of success stories. And I hope our panelists will be able to speak to that and to also highlight good practices in South Asia on occupational safety and health, including prevention and control of COVID-19 at the workplace. And then also to explore, as I mentioned earlier, how to promote dialogue and cooperation between employers and workers and reflect workers' voices for improving safety and health. And then finally, to, to discuss how to extend practical safety and health support to small and medium-sized enterprises and informal economy workplaces and address the needs of disadvantaged groups of workers. And we've asked our panelists to try to speak and address if not all, at least some of these uh, objectives that we want to attain today. So the housekeeping measures have already been uh, uh, elaborated by, by uh, our technical uh, support team. Uh, we will have uh, encourage you to, to pose questions in the Q&A box. And given uh, that we have four speakers, we may not be able to get to all your questions. We'll try to get to them. Those that we cannot uh, respond to uh, in the session, we will also try to answer those directly in the, in the Q&A box. So we have with us a, a group of very distinguished speakers and I'm very, very happy to introduce them and to welcome them to this uh, session. First, uh, Dr. Amara Singer, who is the Director General National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in Sri Lanka. Welcome, Dr. Amra Singh. Really nice to have you. We have second speaker is Mr. Fasil Karim Siddiqui, who is the Secretary General of the Employer uh, Federation of Pakistan. So representing the important voice of employers in this uh, very important conversation. And then we have Mr. Ami, um, Aminur Rashid Repon Chaudhry, uh, who is the Secretary General of the Bangladesh Free Trade Union Congress and also the executive director of the Bangladesh Occupational Health, Safety and Environment Foundation. So welcome, Mr. Chowdhury, very nice to see you. Mr. Chowdhury will also be representing, I think the important voice of, the, of workers in this conversation. And then finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Priyanka Roy, who's the De Dire deputy director medical and the deputy chief inspector of factories, Department of Labor, the government of West Bengal in India, Welcome, Dr. Roy. Thank you. Very nice to see you. Now, very quickly, just each of our panelists will have 10 minutes or so, more or less. We'll try to keep to that time to make some opening remarks, uh, uh, touching upon some of the points that I mentioned earlier, after which we'll, we'll proceed to questions and answers. Uh, and then finally, if there is time available, we'll uh, allow our panelists a few minutes to make some closing remarks. So with that, Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Thank you to our panelists in particular. And I would now like to ask Dr. Amara Singer for her opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Amara Singer, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity on behalf of the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health and by the Ministry of Labor of Sri Lanka. So uh, like a talking about uh, the key challenges and opportunities. So I think this is a kind of a very timely uh, event which is organized by the ILO. And uh, there are like, we are as uh, Southeast Asian uh, countries, all of us may be facing same kind of issues and same kind of uh, occupation safety and health issues 
uh, in industry as well as in the small scale industries. So like uh, talking about the Sri Lankan context, uh, in, in Sri Lankan context with regard to occupational safety and health, I think this is, uh, we as Southeast Asian people, uh, we are not much worrying about our safety and it's not our priority, I would, suppose, I would say. This is uh, the, like uh, safety and health is not one of our priorities. We are given least priority to them. So it applies to the industries as well. So uh, we all are ready to take the risks. Uh, we don't have the risk calculations. We don't take the weighted risks or we don't calculate the risk and take the risk. We are just prone to take the risks because of that, the accidents road traffic accidents and including occupational accidents are uh, i think it's 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 a problem for us but though it is a challenge and though it is a problem in sri lanka if i say we have a problem with the, the data because uh, we uh, don't have much of reliable and uh, timely data to see the gravity of this problem in sri lanka so Data collection is a problem and the reliability of data with regard to occupational accidents and occupational diseases are really a problem which we are facing currently in Sri Lanka. So that is one of the problems. And I mean like one of the challenges because based on the challenge, based on the data, we have to take the decisions. So um, it's, it's, it's one of the key challenges that we are facing currently. Uh, a part of that, uh, we have the problems with awareness of like uh, uh, awareness with regard to safety practices and our behaviors and attitudes are really, uh, I would say it's, uh, it may be it's backward or maybe it's a kind of a, we have to do a lot more things to improve awareness and improve uh, safety awareness among the employers and employees. But uh, the context of the industries. We have large scale industries, we have multinationals, we have uh, the small scale industries, as well as we have the other uh, me medium scale industries. So I really would like to say, and I really would like to uh, state that our multinationals are doing very well with the safety and health in their industries. They are top, they are excellent, and they do lots of things to improve safety and health among the other industries as well. But we have a problem with the small scale industries where they don't consider safety as their priority. So because of that, there is a, a big challenge in improving that. And uh, when you talk about the legislative framework in Sri Lanka, uh, we have the factories ordinance which was done, which was enacted in 1954. And uh, there were a few amendments brought forward with that. So according to the factories ordinance, it has given provisions to provide safety and health only for the said industries. Because of that, the small scale industries are not captured by that. So uh, there's a lot more to improve safety and health in these sectors. Uh, so it's really a national challenge for us. And again, uh, we have to create a behavior-based safety culture in Sri Lanka because our attitudes towards the safety practices are also much more to be improved. It may be because uh, due to the uh, environmental conditions, because it's a warm country, so using these kind of personal protective equipments and other controls may be a little bit difficult for the people. Uh, so there are a lot more contributory factors for these things. But anyway, uh, these are like few key challenges which I highlighted with you all or try to share with you all in this uh, elegant uh, forum. So um, those are like key challenges that we are facing. And again, we need, uh, as a country, we need the uh, legislative framework to be updated and timely updates need to come up come forward 
but we have national safety and health policy which was developed in 19, uh, 2014 by the national institute of occupational safety and health along with the other stakeholding uh, ministries uh, and again it's and again a timely uh, timely requirement that we have to uh, revise our national safety policy as well uh, so uh, these are like a few challenges which we are facing in the country uh, with regard to safety and health and um, when you talk about the uh, when you talk about the success stories with related to safety and health uh, when you talk about uh, the national institute of occupational safety and health itself is a success story in sri lanka because we started in 2011 with even a zero budget and now uh, we have given a mandate to do create awareness training and research on safety and health and we have created more than 5000 uh, qualified safety officers we have improved our safety uh, professional career up to a diploma in occupational safety and health for the industry and it's it's uh, accredited with our national vocational qualifications so those are and again we are sustained now we asked we are very minimally supported by the treasury but we are financing with our own finances so it shows it's a kind of a success story where it shows the requirement of safety developments in the industry they do lots of requests to us and we have to uh, we are supporting the industry uh, with our warm hearts and again uh, talking about a small success story in sri lankan context very recently we did a uh, COVID preventive strategy with the ILO for the small scale industries and we covered about uh, 200 uh, small scale industries uh, in uh, specific districts, uh, namely Kalutara and Gampaha, and we uh, visited them physically and we did safety audits for them, and uh, it was highlighted that uh, they are uh, like they are very much willing to improve their safety standards with the object of improving their businesses so they have uh, like we were able to uh, convince uh, ourselves as well as safety and health to the industry uh, and we were able to convince the small scale industries uh, to say that it is a safety and health is a human right and because of that you will have uh, indirect impacts by improving safety and health, even in the SME sector. So these are few uh, like a uh, recent, uh, recent um, success stories, I would say, which we implemented during the COVID-19 period. And now even the COVID-19 situation in the country, it has uh, like uh, has shown a de declining trend where we are reported about not more than 150 patients per day so it's a great decline which like uh, which we are very proud to say that we also have contributed in this uh, like supporting to this declining trend in covid prevention strategy so these are few things and uh, i think i've given only uh, 10 minutes so i will uh, try to uh, stop from here but i'll be in the forum so that you can yes i think uh, Thank you very much once again, Mr. Alcott. Thank you, Dr. Amarasinghe. Really, really uh, interesting. And, and, and thank you also for, for touching upon on some of the issues that we want to discuss today. I, I, I will come back to you, uh, I think, and also there will probably be questions because there's some really interesting examples. I really like the success stories you mentioned. Um, I mean, it is very impressive what you've done with the National Institute. Uh, I think that is an, a crucial, they have a crucial role to play of the, uh, in this, of course, and the fact that you're sustainable, financially sustainable now, I think is, is really very impressive. Uh, some really interesting work with, uh, with the small scale industries that you mentioned, that you're working with the ILO. Um, and interesting that you also mentioned that the way you convinced them was to uh, highlight the, idea, the fact that occupational safety and health is a, a basic human right. Um, and I have a, a number of questions around that. I think you highlighted the issue of data, which we know is an issue, not only in, in Sri Lanka, but around the world, uh, not only in, 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 in 
developing countries, but also in the developed world, I think we're only seeing the, the tip of the iceberg. And I think there is a real issue in terms of, of having reliable data to be able to plan uh, uh, and, to, and to be able to identify where the real issues are. So I think that's important. You also mentioned the issue of behaviors and attitudes and, and how to improve that. I think that's an important issue. You mentioned the legislative framework. Uh, that it's inadequate in terms of coverage and that's a challenge for you you mentioned um so i think you've you've raised so many really interesting issues um that we will hopefully come back to uh in the q a session and later in the in in the discussion so thanks again very very nice and very good intervention um i'm now going to turn to mr siddiqui uh mr siddiqui from pakistan who represents the uh, uh employer federation of pakistan mr siddiqui very nice to see you uh the floor is yours Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was indeed uh, a pleasure meeting a very mixed galaxy of uh, speakers here this morning. Uh, I find representatives from India and Bangladesh and I have a very spiritual relationship. I was born in India, I was brought up and educated in Bangladesh and I live in Pakistan. So I think uh, we have a very common structure and agenda. I think this uh, uh, conflict itself is very timely because it follows the pandemic. And the pandemic has given some very strong lessons and messages to industry and to the workplace and to the nation in general. The one thing in which the nation realized and the enterprises realized and the individuals realized they were lacking most was the area of health and safety. Because the HR managers had been focusing on many issues of HR, like recruitment, HR planning, selection, training and development. And suddenly they realized, oh, there is a very important role they have to focus upon, and that is occupational health and safety, particularly health and safety at the workplace, which was not on the prime agenda of the professionals. So that is one very important reason why I think this was absolutely needed, that a meeting of this uh, nature should have been organized to discuss the dimensions of OSH in our uh, region. Second important thing as far as Pakistan is concerned, uh, it is important to point out that the uh, alarm was, uh, the alarm bell was rung when Pakistan had the worst accident of fire in a textile factory in 2012, Baldia uh, incident, which is known unfortunately, in which more than 200 workers were burnt because of the failure to provide a safe atmosphere for the workplace. That possibly was an event which shook the country and particularly the province in which the Ali Enterprises was located. And the Employers Federation of Pakistan and the ILO and the government of Sin at that time sat together to ponder as to what are some concrete steps which must be taken to stop such incident not occurring in the future. So the first thing that was done was with the tripartite consultation, we developed the health and safety policy for the province. Now in Pakistan, we have uh, labor as a provincial subject and the all the provinces are independent in making their legislation in the area of labor. So the provincial Sindh health policy was developed with the help of the Tepatai partners. Later on, we were able to enact an exclusive law apart from the Factories Act, because Factories Act is one of the oldest uh, law in the subcontinent, which uh, provides the basic fundamentals for health and safety at the enterprise level, both in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And I believe 
uh, Sri Lanka also has more or less the same legislation, Defective Act of 1935. And for the first time, we were able to introduce a new legislation in the province known as Health and Safety Act 2017 in the province of Sin with uh, a complete consensus of the capitalized partners. And this law for the first time, not only uh, reiterated the uh, measures which were provided in the existing law, but it laid down essential priorities for the stakeholders individually and collectively. So the responsibilities of the employers, the responsibilities of the workers, the responsibilities of the visitors, the responsibilities of the suppliers and vendors have been laid down in the law itself. And it requires every enterprise to make its own health and safety policy and display and disseminate it among their workers. It also, of course, makes it obligatory for enterprises to form their health and safety committees and the infrastructure which can help facilitate the implementation of this provincial law. Soon after this law was implemented in the province of Sin, which is the largest business center of Pakistan, uh, the more or less the same law was replicated in the province of Punjab, uh, which is the largest province of Pakistan in terms of population. And the Health and Safety Act 2020 was promulgated in the province of. We have a national health and safety policy, but we don't have a national health and safety program. That is something that I think uh, needs to be uh, given a priority. And we, as the representative of employers, are working uh, closely with the government to insist that the national health and safety program must come in place in order to uh, improve the three essential requirements or deficits in the health and safety uh, infrastructure. Number one, the awareness uh, and the sensitivity to be created among the uh, stakeholders about the importance of health and safety, irrespective of whether they are in the factory or they are on the road, on the street, in their homes, or anywhere in the country or in the world. The second thing is the implementation of law. Uh, the legal provisions do exist, but as my Sri Lankan friend uh, uh, mentioned, uh, we lack in implementation. And Dr. Amrita Singha, I extremely agree with what you said, that there is a mindset which needs to be transformed towards a health and safety oriented understanding of uh, every action being linked with health and safety first. And I think uh, that is an important need. The, the, the second one is, of course, the legislation and its implementation, the inspection. Unfortunately, the inspection machinery is not as strong as it should be in terms of labor laws. And so is the case with the health and safety law. And therefore, much depends on uh, self-inspection and much depends on self-awareness of enterprises and individuals and trade unions and federations in implementing the law. So the inspection system needs to be tripartite at least in terms of health and safety. And we are working very closely with the government to introduce a tripartite system of inspection uh, so that the health and safety aspect is not easily ignored in enterprises when it comes to providing a safe and healthy workplace to the workers. The third important thing is building a national climate, building a national atmosphere in which everybody starts talking about, about uh, health and safety as a priority. Uh, let this be very clearly known to every stakeholder that health and safety is not the business of the government. Health and safety is not the business of the uh, enterprise. Health and safety is not the business of the trade union. Health and safety is not the business of the CEOs and HR managers. Health and safety is the business of everybody, everywhere, anywhere, anytime. And that climate building is the challenge which I think we face, not only in Pakistan, but in almost 
our entire region. In spite of all the precautions that we take, in spite of all the measures that have been taken, in spite of the best policies that we have, incidents of fire still happen. Incidents of accidents, industrial accidents are still happening. As you rightly said, five people every minute are dying somewhere, somehow, and the majority of it is in our part of the world. So it needs not to be emphasized that it should be, if, uh, it should be, uh, it should be focused in our region. Now at the uh, national level, the Employers Foundation of Pakistan has made health and safety as one of its prior agenda. For the last 15 years, for the last 15 years, we are holding every year a contest of best practices in health and safety among business enterprises. And particularly on the day of Universal uh, Health and Safety Day. Uh, so far, every year, about 25 to 30 companies participate in the context. And they go through, undergo through a very stringent evaluation by an evaluation committee, which visits every factory to validate their information. And then based on the recommendation of the evaluation committee, the companies are awarded with the EFP Best Practices Health and Safety Awards. Now, this has been working uh, now for 15 years, as I said. So, so far, around 500 companies, including the multinational, large national, medium national, and SMEs, have been uh, officially recognized at the private sector level, which has been endorsed by the government, so that they can act as role model as examples for hundreds and thousands of companies otherwise to see as to what sort of standards these companies are uh, implementing, which can be easily replicated in others. I think this is one such initiative. We are, of course, doing it in collaboration with the ILO for the last 15 years. But this has tremendously helped us in making enterprises conscious of uh, being uh, specific in their approach to health and safety. And it has worked well, and I hope it will continue to work well. Last year, we had the International Health and Safety Conference organized in Pakistan for the first time in which we had international and national speakers focusing on health and safety as an essential component of business and human rights, particularly in the wake of the pandemic. And it was a very, very successful event in which about 300 enterprises participated and were able to benefit from the thought and experience and philosophy and mission of companies which are working so hard to make health and safety a formidable and essential uh, framework for their survival. I think because of shortage of time, I don't want to proceed further but uh, we will have occasion to hear from our distinguished panelists about their experiences. And I think these experiences together need to be combined collectively and given a very fortified structure so that enterprises at the much, uh, place level and uh, governments at the national level are able to get appropriate guidance in framing national health and safety program and enterprises their own health and safety structures. Thank you very much. Mr. Siddiqui, thank you so much. You've raised again so many, many important points. I, I'm going to maybe highlight one or two. I really liked what you said that health and safety is the business of everybody. I think we now know from experience that all successful health and safety initiatives involve coordinated action, involves collective action. Um, it's not the responsibility, as you said, of government alone. It's not the responsibility of business alone. It's not the responsibility of trade unions alone. So I think that idea of collective action is a really important one that you've stressed, and I, I, I really want to commend you for that. Um, the other thing that I think you mentioned towards the end, which I really liked as well, is this, and I think this is also uh, what Dr. Amarasinghe mentioned, is that there are the big companies, the ones that are connected to global supply chains who maybe are suppliers to big companies or are even big companies themselves nationally <clears throat> that have great practices. 
And the idea really is, and I think you talked about role models for other companies, and I like this idea of, of your, uh, con you know, the contest and the awards, because I think one also has to, we know that there's great potential, not only for vertical knowledge sharing, so large companies to smaller ones or multinationals to local companies, but we also know that there are, there's a lot of opportunity for knowledge sharing horizontally. So amongst companies in the same industry at the same level of production. And I think this idea of, of, of a role model for others is really important. You talked about inspection, you talked about a number of other issues that I'm not going to, to discuss now, but thank you so much. I think there are so many really important points that you've made that we're going to come back to in the discussion. So thank you, Mr. Siddiqui, very much. I'm going to now turn over to uh, Mr. Chowdhury. Mr. Chowdhury, the, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, uh... Do you hear me? Very well. Uh, thank you. So first of all, uh, thank you and the organizers of this event for inviting me to speak at this important OHS webinar. We have uh, now the big picture in hand, already Mr. Rocker says that uh, the, the ILO estimates that shows 2.7 million women and men around the world succumb to work-related accidents or disease every year. This corresponded to over 7,500 deaths every single day. Worldwide, there are around 3, 340 million occupational accidents and 160 million victims of work-related illness annually. In Asia, uh, we have already heard from uh, earlier um, uh, statements uh, by the speakers that Asia is one of the highest contributor and constitute about two thirds of the global work-related mortality. Within the Asia, health and safety rights situation in South Asia is much worse as compared to Southeast Asia or East Asia. If you see uh, three key uh, occupational health and safety instruments in ILO, they are the convention number 155, Occupational Safety and Health Convention, 1981, uh, Protocol 155 uh, of 2002 to the Occupational Health and Safety Convention 1981, and also the uh, Convention 187, Promotional Framework for Occupational Health and Safety Convention 2006. But when we go to look at uh, the status in South Asia, you know, it is we, we become very frustrated because we can't see none of this convention or protocols been ratified by any South Asian countries such as Bangladesh, Nepal, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Afghanistan. And uh, we have already heard from the previous speaker that existing National Safety Council in many countries within South Asian region found mm, not very effective and some cases non-functional. Most of the countries in South Asia are still struggling to deliver an effective national occupational health and safety policy profile and program of action at national level due to lack of political commitment on health and safety right issues. Workplaces are not becoming any safer than in last three decades within the South Asian region. Furthermore, they are also significant number of unreported and undocumented cases of occupational disease, which we call shortly ODS. These recurring accidents can partly be attributed to the imbalanced power relations between the capital and labor, and thus infrastructure for workplace safety monitoring in most of the South Asian countries are insufficient and ineffective. In this context, the right and visibility and recognition of occupational and, and environmental victims remains a major challenge in Bangladesh and also other countries at South Asian region. Victims and their families have to go through difficult hurdle in getting compensation. Victims of occupational disease do not have access to the limited number of medical practitioners and do not have enough resources to get diagnosed. Meanwhile, government and employers in most of the countries in South Asia fail to ensure victims' medical treatment costs, pushing them further to poverty. Occupational accident victims and survivors in Bangladesh and other countries in South Asia have multiple vulnerabilities, income insecurity, physical and health issues, comorbidities, and these existing vulnerabilities are 
further aggravated by the pandemic. The employment impact of COVID-19 in many nations with South Asia experiences experiencing disease epidemics were sharp and deep. In many countries in South Asia, the COVID-19 emergency has highlighted gaps in social security protections. Impl unemployment insurance entitlements have not provided adequate benefit to many workers who lost employment during economic shutdowns. And in many jurisdictions, entitlement to sick leave, have, sick leave benefits was a workplace benefit policy rather than a universal protection. In South Asia, the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected industries and it has more severely affected labor inter intensive export oriented sectors such as ready-made garments, as well as to the workers at informal economy among, and on, among the migrant workers. In South Asia, countries that included Bangladesh where more than 70% of the labor force are at informal sector, dependent on daily based job and income are largely suffering inadequate income due to impact of the pandemic. Poverty level has increased. During the lockdown and pandemic, government of most of South Asian countries have invented economic rescue programs to sustain the economy and support the livelihood of low-income workers. Those, these social security schemes have had some impact on maintenance of livelihood of the workers and their families, but it was temporary. It was not sufficient for the informal workers who don't have savings or a source of income. It also did not cover migrant workers in most of the countries. I, I now jump to the findings of the third ITUC global COVID-19 survey of 148 trade unions from 107 countries, including 17 G20 countries and 35 OECD countries carried out between 20 to 23rd April 2020 showed the gap in access to safe workplace and the global concern to the provision of personal protective equipment for health care workers and other workers who are in the who are in the front lines. Globally, occupational health and safety must be included by the International Labor Organization as a fundamental rights with global standards to protect workers. Velia's illustration shows that workplace in South Asia emerging as new front line for COVID-19 spread due to weak implementation of uh, related health guidelines and health and safety related laws, large section of workers facing shortage of personal protective equipment. A recent survey in COVID-19 context observed that most of the garment workers in Bangladesh facing difficulties to maintain health related rules or guidelines as they work and live in congested places. We also observed that pandemic has also given excuse for employers to lack their safety standards and commitment. This has resulted in many recent accidents across South Asia, such as LG chemical plant gas leak in India, BSRM rerolling mill accidents in Bangladesh, mine accidents in Myanmar and Pakistan, etc. Workers facing a difficult decision like trading employment with disease, otherwise their families will go hungry. COVID has exposed the deep OHS and social security crisis in South Asia. 2019 was marked the official start of the centenary year of the ILO where Global Commission report on the future of work was presented in June 2019. ILO's decent work agenda is one of the four pillars of this report, which stressed on the importance of work that is safe and secure with social protection and respect for rights at work to achieve sustainable inclusive economic growth, eliminate poverty and to ensure the voice of the poor and marginalized are heard. We cannot assume that COVID-19 will be gone tomorrow. It will be with us for a long time and resilience both for people's health and for regenerating and sustaining economies, uh, regenerating, sorry. Sorry, uh, we cannot assume that COVID-19 will be gone tomorrow. It will be with us for a long time and resilience both for the people 
health and for regenerating and sustaining economic activity is dependent on safe and healthy workplace. Ensuring health and safety in workplace must be highlighted priority as people return to work in many South Asian countries emerging from COVID-19 restrictions. And if you go to see the Bangladesh context, we have already heard from other speakers that you know, we have the same problems in Bangladesh like as uh, statistics. Uh, the health and safety is not a priority and the national priority list. Uh, poor health and safety culture, informal workers are not uh, covered by the current existing law. Besides that, we have some uh, good, uh, I can say some success story also in Bangladesh context with, such as uh, formulation of occupational health and safety policy, which was initiated primarily this discussion by the trade unions and the lab, uh, labor support NGOs such as OSHA Foundation in, in 2007, where brings all the stakeholders in the same table, including ILO and WHO, to start the discussion on the need for occupational health, safety and health policy in Bangladesh and collectively develop this drug uh, uh, through the discussion process. And certainly it was quite lucky when the Rana Plaza tragedy happened and government pick up those drug and uh, uh, endorsed this national policy and followed by framing of national OHS profile and national first draft national program of action. And also uh, the trade unions and, and, the, and the OSHA and other support institutions supported uh, the government and, the, and, the, and the, in, uh, the, in the in the process of amendment of national labor law to include some key uh, uh, provisions such as health and safety committee, uh, provision of health and safety committee at the workplace or uh, provision of safety count, uh, formulation of national health safety councils, et cetera. So uh, we have some uh, exam good example for collective approach and, act, and, and together we can make something, but this, this also need to be further strengthened to, uh, to make a safer workplace and decent work a reality in Bangladesh and also within the South Asian region and uh, together in collective approach. So, Ensuring health and safety in workplace must be highlighted priority as people's return to work. Uh, occupational health and safety should be a fundamental rights at work. That is the demand for the time and we should collectively work in this direction. For the time being, thanks to you. Mr. Chari, thank you so much. Uh, really important points that you've mentioned. I'm not gonna be able to jump to, to get to all of them, but. I think you you again reinforced the 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 what we know even from limited statistics that Asia has one of the highest uh, rates of mortality related to work uh, to work related injuries and diseases as you mentioned two thirds. I think you mentioned an important point and as an ILO official I wanted to uh, also speak a little bit about the the the, the status in South Asia as you mentioned on ratifications. And I think you must, you're probably aware that as we speak, uh, you know, the governing body of the ILO is taking place in the building where I am right now. And as you know, there is discussion on making occupational safety and health a fundamental right and principle at work in the ILO. Um, and I think that's an important discussion to have. And I think also, I think the impetus brought about by COVID-19 has made this a, a really important discussion. And I think may also change the discussion that is taking place within the governing body. But as you know, uh, if, if that happens, and, and I don't know how that discussion is going to evolve, then all countries will have to report on what, you know, on, on, on the implementation of the of the convention, even if they have not ratified it. So I think that is important. And I think against the background of the absence of ratifications in Asia, that, that might actually be an important development. You mentioned a very important point, and I think we don't often, when we talk about safety and health, talk about in a holistic way and thinking, we, we talk a lot about prevention, and I think prevention is incredibly important. And I think this is the culture of prevention that we want to uh, that we want to instill in workplaces and in countries. But also there's this idea of protection. What do you do if an accident happens? How do you protect workers? And I think and workers and their families if, if the worker unfortunately perishes. And I think you've raised a really important point. So I think we also need to think 
about employment injury insurance and strengthening the, the systems that exist. And I know in Bangladesh that there, there, there are a lot of discussions ongoing at the moment about establishing a, an affordable and effective employment injury uh, system, because I think you also mentioned the link between the absence of a poly, the absence of a system and, and poverty because workers don't have the support, they don't have access to medical care, and it drives them deeper into poverty. So I think that discussion, we always, when we talk about safety and health, I think we really need to take that into account as well. And, and then very, very quickly, I like the success stories. And, and I think the, the idea that you, of, uh, um, of bringing stakeholders together around uh, a, a tragic event. I mean, you talked about the fires, you also talked about Rana Plaza. I think that's, you know, those are the kinds of events that unfortunately you know, provide impetus for for developments, and it sounds like it's it's also contributed a lot to the to the formulation of the OSH policy. And then you mentioned OSH committees, bipartite committees, important as well. And we can talk about that in the Q and A. So thank you so much, Mr. Chowdhury. Very very nice intervention. Uh, let me turn to our last speaker now, uh, Dr. Roy. The floor is yours. Good afternoon everybody uh, and my uh, i'm very thankful to get this kind of opportunity to talk about my subject now occupation safety and health in this platform so this is a very uh, this is an excellent opportunity where i can share one uh, you may call it good practice or uh, something what i have done for I am I'm working in that for last three years. So I will answer all those questions after discussing this uh, local action, what, uh, what we were taken to prevent silicosis and mitigation and treatment and rehabilitation scheme in West Bengal, India. So uh, as uh, silicosis, this is very bad kind of lung disease, which is occupational disease purely and caused by the inhalation of silica at workplace. So this is notifiable disease. And just one thing, can, we, uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So this is a statutory obligation from all the um, statutory obligation, all the act, act, like Factories Act or Mines Act, or Building and Construction Workers Act, and also it is covered under Employee State Insurance Act. So it is, uh, why this is important? Uh, because we are having many deaths because of silicosis for last few years, where the pe people are working in particularly unorganized sector, where uh, I call them invisible workers. You know, they are working, they are, uh, contributing towards the production, but you cannot find out any name or any uh, other acknowledgement in any paper. So it's very difficult for us as statutory body to identify those invisible workers, how they are getting exploited at their work. So in that way, uh, this is the problem for us when we are going for inspection. If there is uh, the the industry that does not exist in our department, the database, as Madam said, that uh, the lack of data, the insufficient data, it's very uh, difficult for the statutory body to identify those vulnerables. So it was what I'm talking about this uh, in 2017, we got some news from uh, news channel and other NGOs that there are patients uh, of silicosis, they are dying because of silica, silicosis. And at the same time, some NGOs, they co complained against depart our, our department and an uh, Honorable National Human Rights Commission. They sent us the uh, recommendation and compliance. They asked for the compliance, why people are dying and we do not know. So I was there fortunately, and I got the opportunity to work with uh, that. So I started working on that particular area where uh, those migrant, basically those, those workers were migrant and they uh, went uh, to work after the one natural calamity for their livelihood. So I started working with 
identifying the problem area we identified one block area this is uh, in north chobish uh, 24 porgonas adjacent to bangladesh and i started meeting with other stakeholders uh, from a workers representative and then uh, the other control pollution control board and health department because people when they are getting any kind of health uh, issues they go uh, to health center they are not coming to statutory body so i have to ask the people who are taking care of those sick people then we have a research institute that part of uh, research Inst icmr so, uh, and I got also people from other district administration, those who are taking care of other issues of that victims. So we had a meeting and uh, we arranged one uh, health uh, camp in that particular area. And also uh, who, uh, like, who will uh, diagnose the whether this is silicosis and not TB or silicosis and other disease. So that is very difficult because we do have the protocol prescribed by ILO and this is a uh, robust protocol where we need four doctors and we need, uh, not four doctors, two doctors minimum. And then uh, we have that, uh, that uh, ILO extra plate prescribed, which we need to identify whether silicosis is there or not. We use that particular uh, format. So we, uh, that was a problem. So our de department set up one silicosis detection committee where I'm also the member. Then we started with the X-ray plate, X-ray uh, getting X-ray in uh, one one uh, diagnostic center because that health center they do not have the good quality of X-ray machine, which is prescribed for the X-ray for ILO rating. And then again we collected that X-ray plates for screen screening to prepare our report. So this is the area you can see. I don't know whether uh, you can see the other slides because I cannot see. No, we can only see the slide with the uh, with the map, but the slides below that uh, were not visible. Oh, uh, can we? Can you have uh, the backup slides? Um, I can check with Adarsh. I don't know if you have it. Uh, Adarsh, if you have the backup slides, we can maybe bring them up. Okay, so I'm continuing anyway. I think so, so please. Thank you, Dr. Roy. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we started with the meeting in uh, with the villagers first because they are the people who can give the exact data about their sickness, about their health. So we started, we had a meeting on 19th April, 2018 with the all villagers in that particular village. They came initially, they were not convinced because we, uh, like they were very uh, skeptical whether they are getting something, some benefit or not, or they are going to be exploited again. So we convinced them that we are from government people. We are here for good intention for your rehabilitation or anything, we are here. So we had that meeting with the block medical officer of health and for particular block and then uh, joined a video from that uh, district administration people, also the villagers and then NGO who, who initiated the whole uh, procedure. And then we visited the home, uh, the home at home, some of the victims. Uh, I uh, like we visited two people at their home. They were at very bad condition, and within few months we lost them. Both of them died. Uh, I'm sorry you cannot see those slides, but it's all there. Okay. Then we screened all those uh, patient. We all those extra plates. We got 131 extra plates from that uh, consecutive three or four. Uh, time of camps and then we examined all those plates. We identified 34 cases were there and um, those who are having dust exposure history for through to five years. Unfortunately, we got by that time there 30, uh, 24 deaths were there because of silicosis and silico tuberculosis. But uh, after that, we that regular health camp that has been started in that particular area and those who already affected with that disease, they we know that uh, occupational lung disease cannot be cured. 
they are going to die sooner or later but not uh, much uh, sooner than the expected their age so that is very uh, unfortunate thing which uh, we cannot change but what we can do from our government we can assess their health and we can give them their at least their justice so honorable any uh, sir ji um, they asked us to do two things first to identify those victims and then uh, to give and uh, secondly to give them rehabilitations uh, monetary uh, rehabilitation thing and to uh, make a policy in our uh, in our government so that we can have some robust uh, written document where we can have the silicosis prevention and mitigation and rehabilitation policy we have worked on that for last two years so just beginning of this year last month in fact we are able to give 2 lakhs uh, monetary fund for those who are already affected with silicosis and those who are due the next of kin for deceased people they got 4 lakhs rupees and we very soon we have now election in west bengal so after that we will have our policy on paper so this is how we comply to honorable nhrc and they closed their case for now because uh, of our good compliance good uh, like uh, example of compliance we comply whatever nhrc told us to do the honorable human rights commission when it's related to human rights of workers we worked that thoroughly so we uh, both way we have now something to help the workers and now when we started the work we have one uh, this work like this is a kind of good practice and we are replicating the same to other district where the uh, people are there the population are there they are working in that uh, stone crusher unit and other the sil silica dust related work so what were the challenges we faced those are the like first of all that matching the diagnostic criteria as prescribed by ilo because ilo has standard at international level i tra got training from ilo at that level but when we come i, will, I uh, like need to work at local level not even regional at local level it's very difficult you don't you can't find any good quality of x ray you can't find trained doctor who can diagnose the particular occupational disease not only silicosis we have other 28 disease occupational disease those are those are like almost undiagnosed because there is no proper training for doctors in occupational disease this is another that madam also mentioned that so this is a very uh, difficult situation for doctors to identify this kind of disease is happening also do we, there is no uh, pulmonary function test facilities some areas are in that island which in between nowhere like you cannot uh, see anything except water so it's islands and uh, it's very difficult to continue this kind of camp there so we uh, i like uh, those are the challenges to identify occupational disease so we need to assess the hazard exposure and expose vulnerable group as those invisible workers we cannot find them they are working mostly in an organized sector and uh, and obstacles there are not much infrastructural support and access to care or personnel and there are not much uh, impaneled diagnostic center also reactive approach as uh, occurred you told in the morning that whenever we are having some problem we are rushing towards that we are uh, getting something done for that moment but we need have need to have the proactive approach where we can prevent occupational disease we can prevent occupational accident we are having a people like family where the bread winner he died at the age of 18 can you imagine at the age of 18 he died because he did a, a lot of extra work for extra wage so this is very unfortunate thing we are having this kind of uh, situation we have to control and um, last of all road map if you can ask for well, like this is for future i think we need to identify where the problem is who are the most affected population who are the vulnerable 
uh, as uh, Mr. Siddiqui said, that safety and health is not the responsibility of government or civil society or NGOs. Or not in this is individuals. Uh, responsibility and for that we need to generate that safety culture at every level e even if in my home i have to practice that safety culture not only that this this change should come that i should work like this i should not do this so this this should come with our proactive uh, engagement our cooperation collaboration like this and uh, we need to have more occupational disease diagnostic center at the problem district we need to coordination, extend our coordination more and more with statutory body, worker representative, ILO, and other industry people. That's why I'm continuing uh, um, organizing, like organizing seminars, uh, conference. I had some research work with tea garden workers because being a woman, I'm the first woman doctor in labor inspectorate. Before me, there was no female doctor. So I had the opportunity to work. We were the uh, female intensive uh, industries like beer factory, like tea garden factory. So those are the areas I am grateful that I have got this opportunity to work. Lastly, we need to comply with the ILO standards as uh, uh, Ripon said that we, we should have the national trust to maintain that ILO safety and health convention number 155 and convention 187. I have been trained in the ILO. I know what is going on internationally. But when I come to a come back to work at my place, sometimes there are gaps. There are huge gaps. We need to do more research, more work. And uh, yes, and thank you. I hope I have answered like all the questions you put, like what are successful measures. And one thing I need to uh, uh, like I need to state here that uh, during this COVID pandemic, the all the inspection system that has been just serves, shut down because of the there was uh, we cannot like uh, tell people come together to get your. Uh, regular that periodical medical examination done because we know how contagious this virus is. So for last one year, it's very pathetic situation in, in industries where we do not have we do not have any uh, like periodical medical examination. And by this year, they will start with because many examination were just uh, like for uh, pulmonary function test. It it was just it was not there, it was not available for factories, all those. So yes, um, and also we need to work for the vulnerable group. As I said, vulnerable groups means where people, poor people, and then they are migraine. Migration is a huge problem in uh, um, factories inspectorate. We cannot trace or track that patient who are working under the contractors. And uh, whenever I'm asking people, uh, like how many people are working in this particular factory during my inspection, every time they told me the same thing, yes, we have 500 people. And then I need to ask how many under contractors? Then they tell, oh, there are 1,200. So 1,200 plus 500, so 1,700. Yeah, so this yeah. kind of situation, yeah. Good. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Roy. And I think it's a really interesting uh, success story. I'm sorry about the mishap with the slides, but I think you still came, uh, you know, got your message across very well. Um, and I think, you know, one or two things you said that I think are really important is, is we need to really identify where the vulnerable workers are, uh, what is the real problem, where is the problem situated. And I think that sort of also speaks to this idea, the issue of data that, that we've mentioned a number of times before. You've also mentioned again the, the joint responsibility based on organizational roles that all of us have and all the different stakeholders have to play in, 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 in improving safety and health. I think the one thing you mentioned, and I think it ties a little bit into this, uh, this idea of promoting a safety culture, as you said, at the end, the labor inspector kind of during COVID-19 has broken down. So I think it makes it also makes it very important that as somebody else mentioned about self-assessment and, 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 and instilling a, a culture of prevention, 
in workplaces, how important that is. I think that was Dr. Amara Singh. Here. And I think, you know, if inspectorates have limited resources, not only in developing countries around the world, so how do we instill this culture of prevention in organizations so that it's not completely and totally reliant on the labor inspectorates? And we know the labor inspectorates do not reach the most vulnerable workers very often. So I think this is something we need to maybe come back to in the Q&A. Thank you so much to all our speakers. We have a, a little bit of time for q and I think we're running uh, a little bit behind time. There's one question that I want to, uh, uh, to pose to you. We've received one question in the chat uh, on the Q&A box. And I think it is for our representatives from the different countries. And I'm, I'm going to uh, ask you to, to respond to this if you can. Uh, the question is, um, Ship breaking, particularly ship breaking, is one of the dangerous sectors in all three countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India. And what, if you know anything about this, what are the various steps that are being undertaken to protect workers in the ship breaking industry in the countries, in your countries? So I'm going to put this question out there. Maybe Dr. Amara Singh, I don't know if you want to take a first stab at it, and then we can go around and see if others are also interested in answering this. Thank you. Um, yes, actually, uh, we do not have a large industry of ship, ship breaking, but we also have, uh, like, uh, in our docks, there are ship uh, repairs are being done, and uh, these uh, ships, I mean, like, I know that it's a hazardous industry, and there are lots of uh, hazards and risks and things are going on, but uh, lots of, uh, like, uh, lots of people, lots of uh, workers, they engage with uh, sandblasting and painting and they are working in, in confined spaces. So the things are going on, but uh, our docs, they have taken lots of precautions. And uh, uh, I would say, though it is a very hazardous industry, uh, we have taken lots of steps to prevent our people. And the injuries are very minimal, I would say, in a dockyard. And uh, like uh, you know, lots of uh, welfare facilities are being given, um, and uh, almost all the protective equipments are are being worn by the employees, and they are working with the, the said protections. So though we don't have a large shipbreaking industry, we our people are also exposing in a in a in a like not in a great way, but uh, we have a small industry that. But uh, I would say they are engaged with hazardous work, but they are trying themselves to protect the workers and the employers and employees, both parties are committed to protect and prevent uh, from the health hazards. So we are also very closely monitoring them. Uh, and that is the status of ship. Uh, ship repairs in Sri Lanka, I would say these ship repairs, not uh, breaking industry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amara Singh. Yes, in fact, the question did mention, didn't mention Sri Lanka, but I'm very glad that you, you still uh, highlighted that there's ship repairs and the work that's being done. Mr. Siddiqui, I don't know if you want to answer, uh, uh, you know, about the, or respond to this question in the context of uh, Pakistan. Do you feel comfortable? Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. I think uh, ship uh, breaking industry is a very important uh, industry and equally hazardous. Uh, we don't have very specific laws for health and safety in ship breaking industry, but do we, we do have the health and safety guidelines uh, for Asia and Pacific region regionally developed uh, in, for, for ship breaking industry. And uh, one of the points that we are taking up with the government in legislation uh, on health and safety is now covering the vulnerable sectors and specific sectors. And I think we are in the process of engaging ourselves uh, in legislation for ship breaking, uh, as we are going to have a very specific project in developing, in, in, in studying uh, other rights, uh, human rights area than ship breaking. This is going to be one of the priorities that uh, Employers Federation and the government in Sindh is going to take. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Siddiqui. Um, Mr. Chowdhury, do you have um, any specific views on this or any news you can share with us from Bangladesh? 
Yes, uh, sheep breaking industry is, uh, Bangladesh is one of the uh, second largest uh, sheep breaking uh, operations uh, in, the, in, the, in the region. And each year uh, we have a lot of uh, occupation work related accidents and uh, deaths occur because of the unsafe working condition. And it's very sad that uh, sheep breaking industry is almost uh, in Bangladesh for last 40 years more, but uh, it, it has not been still um, able to improve its, uh, its uh, health and safety uh, standards and, uh, and, uh, and the, the compliance level has not uh, yet been improved because of the lack of cooperation between the employer and, and the workers and government in this area because uh, many, some of the people believe that it's a sensitive sector. It's, it's, it's the source of the iron ore in the country cannot be touched. Uh, so, uh, so, the, so there are a lot of um, uh, lot of um, things uh, that need to be resolved. Um, but this industry is hazardous, and we have already conducted some sampling study uh, among the uh, four, 200 workers uh, and found that. 35 uh, workers are uh, exposed to the asbestos. So chemical and uh, asbestos exposure is a big issues here and, and also the environmental issues. Unsafe working condition every year, um, uh, around 10 to 15 workers died falling from the uh, higher ships while they go, cut it, uh, go for cutting. So, and, and a lot of uh, occupational work-related disease that are not um, uh, reported and labor inspection is very much uh, uncovered in this area. And for that area, it's a, is located in Shitakundo. Only one inspector is responsible for whole area, not for specific for ship breaking industry. So labor inspection is a big issue there. And we've been pushing the government for improving the labor inspection status there and also the enforcement of law, but uh, still uh, the situation has not improved. And there are a lot of rooms for, for government uh, workers and employers in this sector working together to prove that this industry is, um, is to be sustainable, environment friendly, and that requires safer and decent work. That need to be, uh, they to work together to improve. And this is the demand of the time. And so we should, must focus uh, ship breaking as one of the priority areas for action from health and safety angle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chari. Uh, a very detailed answer, and, and it's interesting to hear what, what developments are taking place in, um, in your country. Dr. Roy, I don't know if you wanted to feel comfortable answering on uh, what's happening in your country related to, to this uh, industry as an, uh, as a labor inspector, whether you have any views on this? Uh, for the matter of fact, we are not taking care of uh, ship breaking units that comes under different law. So we are taking care of only Factories Act 1948. And so I barely have any idea, sorry. No problem, no problem at all. Um, it, it does seem that, that there are um, specific industries that are excluded um, yes, from, yes. from the labor inspectorate, which I think is also something we, we would like to maybe talk about in the um, 14 minutes that's left. Uh, there's one question that came in uh, what is the role of labor inspection and skills development in safety and health? It seems that it's a large, a large part of the problem is related to skills development. And I guess this means uh, uh, knowledge on, on occupational safety and health. So maybe Dr. Roy, since you're uh, representing labor inspectorate, you could maybe talk a little bit about the, about the role of the labor inspectorate, the important role, and also the role of the labor inspectorate in not only inspecting, but also, you know, to some extent, advising and, and, and improving capacity uh, on, uh, of, 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 uh, of the employers and also of the workers. So uh, even in, uh, if you see Factories Act and Factories um, Rule uh, 1958 for West Bengal, we do have that obligation that we have to organize a periodical a seminar or conference and that um, drill, mock drill, these kinds of activities for workers and with the involvement of the occupier, that means the occupier, the occupier of that factory and the other uh, management people. So 
our, under uh, this law, we are working on that repeatedly, like all the year, throughout the year, we have various agenda to create this kind of skilled worker at their workplace. As I'm a doctor, I have the, uh, like, I have the responsibility to treat, to um, train the doctors who are the factory medical officer working in particular different factories. So we do have that kind of uh, like seminars. Like we organized one seminar two years back with all the tea garden doctors in Doers area in North Bengal, Darjeeling and Jalpaiguri, all those uh, districts. So those are the uh, doctors who were who attended that uh, seminar where they were taught about the health problems at tea garden workers. Again, we other like we are organizing other seminars at with the help of the uh, like university where people are there with their research paper with their research. So we uh, bring them together in one platform where the research people are there, the uh, professors from university, from uh, expert trained in ILO and uh, from the inspectorate. We are all there. We organizing this kind of uh, activities to train people ab about the occupational safety and health, about the international, um, about that stand, stand like uh, standards, ILO conventions, all those. Even last year, last uh, two in 2000, last year we had the pandemic. Before that in 2019, we had one um, conference with ILO Delhi office. So we had guests from Delhi, uh, New Delhi office. Um, Yo Yoshi was there. She, uh, he came there for the training of the people from the different industry. So that's how we are working together to train people. So I think uh, yeah, that, thank that's you, how we inspector work. Right, right. I think that there is a very important sort of educational role for labor inspectors as well. And in, in, in not only, uh, you know, not only the strict inspection role and, and, and monitoring. Yes, sir. we are not only for inspection, we right. also have do have other roles. So, so Dr. Roy, before I, I, I have a couple of questions also for the other speakers, but there's one specific question related to mining, to illegal mining in India. And, and I think one of the questions that may you may uh, be able to answer is related to the, I don't know if you're aware of the district mineral funds. Yes, that uh, is. Which, yes. And, and the question really is, how is that being utilized to set up medical facilities for silicosis and OSH? So in a way, I think the question is really, you know, how, is, how are those funds being channeled for uh, safety and health rehabilitation and prevention, in particularly in mining and particularly related to silicosis? Uh, apart from my inspect inspectorate work, I uh, we have like I visited Rajasthan on behalf of my uh, department. So we visited Rajasthan. They have this kind of district mineral mineral fund where there are funds. They are uh, being used for the rehabilitation scheme for silicosis patient, and that is particularly used for the mine people. We are the people from factories. We are taking care of factories act. We are not taking care of mines act. But still, I do know that 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 was the funds where the mines worker, if they are contracted with the silicosis, they got fund from for their rehabilitation purpose from the district mineral trust, and that is being kept under the district magistrate of that particular district. So that's how it works. But uh, I know from my experience, because I visited Rajasthan for uh, silicosis uh, like scheme and to see how they are working to come back and replicate from our department. So that's how I know. But this is, uh, we are not uh, responsible for this kind of fund and all. So I think that you can. Yeah, Please no, go. thank you, yeah, Dr. I, Roy. Thank you, Dr. Roy. I wanna you. just have, I have a, a quick question here before I'm gonna ask you all just uh, to wrap up. I have a question here for uh, our representatives from India and Bangladesh. Um, and I guess uh, maybe also for others, um, in, in particular related to India and Bangladesh, the question is the, the new OSH law, the safety and health law has been passed successfully. Um, could you please share your experience very briefly, of course, on how, uh, how far this has been adopted by employers and workers? So I guess it's related 
uh, in particular to the implementation. So maybe Mr. Chowdhury, I don't know if I can speak, you know, ask you that, uh, that question because you mentioned specifically the new law that's being passed. Very briefly, please. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Actually, uh, our, uh, the OSH issues uh, in Bangladesh is uh, covered by the uh, Bangladesh Labor Act, uh, one single law, uh, where different provisions are there in, in relation to occupational health and safety issues. And this, uh, this labor law, which covered the OHS issue, has been amended uh, several times after uh, the Rana Plaza tragedy, and some of the new provisions were included as I said before my intervention, such as um, uh, uh, the provisions for health and safety committee, uh, requirement for health establishment of health and safety committee, the provisions for, for um, uh, the, uh, the amendment of compensations, the provisions uh, on uh, the party training and education at the uh, workplaces on occupational health and safety, and also the development of um, uh, OSH profile and guideline, etc. But still, uh, there are uh, there are a lot of uh, there are rooms to further improve of it. And right now in Bangladesh, there is a process going on on further amendment of this labor law. And we are engaged with the government and employers with uh, some recommendations, further um, make some recommendations that is all, all discussing at the bipartite and tripartite level. To further amendment of this law and to to ensure the health and safety rights of the workers properly implemented at the, at the national sector and workplaces level to uh, to make decent work a reality and to ensure the rights of the fundamental rights is uh, prevailing there under the law and in practice so this is very continuous process and we are engaged with this and we are hoping that through this process we will be able to deliver a expected good uh, which is provisions under the under amended labor law in coming future if the things goes collectively well thank you no thank you so much uh, thank you mr chowdhury now we have five minutes left this has been of course way too short uh, a time to to discuss all the really interesting issues that you've raised i'm going to ask you all please uh, if you have one minute and uh, to please strictly stick to that time just to make some closing remarks very very quickly highlight uh, you know, one or two things that you maybe heard today that you want to follow up on. Um, because I do think what Mr. Siddiqui said at the beginning, and I also think there was interesting before we all went live, uh, there was a conversation between Dr. Amara Singh and Dr. Roy about exchanging practices and, 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 and making sure that within the region, you share these experiences. So you know, with that, with that, in that spirit, I would very much like you to make some, you know, just one minute closing remarks. So, uh, uh, Dr. Amara Singer, can we start with you? Just very briefly, please. You're muted, Dr. Amara Singer. Yeah. You're muted? Right. Yes, yeah. please. Sorry, Thanks. Sorry, Just one minute. Yeah. One minute, if possible. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I would conclude my uh, speech uh, by requesting all of us to get together and do uh, like go for a nice network, whereas we can share experiences, we can share knowledge, and even we can uh, share about the research findings each each and every person has. So that would be one of the like uh, key things that I thought of uh, going forward with this. And uh, I really would like to invite you all for the National Safety and Health Excellence Awards ceremony, which will be held in October in Sri Lanka. Like as uh, 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 Mr. Siddiq said in Pakistan, we are also having, we have commenced our con, uh, Excellence Awards uh, competition now. So people, the industries are like participating and they're like applying. So we also have a tedious process, but anyway, we'll have a gala event on the October. So I would really like to invite all of you all to be participated with us uh, in Sri Lanka uh, with the objective of uh, improving commitment from employers and employees towards safety and health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Amrasinga. That's a really nice way to end. Uh, Mr. Siddiqui, over to you for one minute, please. Mrs. Siddiqui, you're muted. There you are. Can you hear me now? Okay, I think. Radhika. Okay, I think it was an indeed an excellent learning 
activity this morning and we have been able to gain a lot of uh, new things particularly from dr roy and uh, the bangladesh experience and indian experience i think i need not emphasize more than this that the culminating point is the training on occupational health and safety what we need is training training and training at every level even inspection may not work as strong as training even legislation does not work as strong as training we had trained about 400 managers and workers in shalcourt sports goods industry on occupational safety and health as our training program of employers federation of pakistan so i think this is one of the prime thing the last thing that i would like to say is there is no substitute for collective action we need to start thinking about collective action at the national level at the regional level the national policies of the countries in the region may be may be uh, uh, brought together and we can have a regional policy on health and safety and i think we can also develop some regional guidelines for enterprises uh, in the region for occupational health safety particularly in the post pandemic period because pandemic may be over hopefully in a year or so but its impact and effect is going to be long lasting and yeah. there does not exist any such manual which can possibly work we have developed the soft guide sop guidelines but i think a regional uh, manual could be a good uh, uh, learning lesson from today that we can from today's discussion that we can do for the future thank you thank you mr sadiki very very good suggestion uh, very very quickly we have very little time mr chaudhry maybe some very very brief closing remarks sorry thank to, you uh, uh, sorry to cut you short <laughs> no problem thank you uh, so i'll uh, pick up the point from mr sadiki says there is no alternative of collective approach and action so we should work together collectively to uh, building a safer workplace at the national uh, uh, and and the region sub regional level and uh, make uh, the safety culture uh, at the at the national local and regional level dangerous working conditions are common in south asia they kill maim and sicken thousands of workers every day but true extent of this problem is grossly underestimated these victims worker have no access to Uh, treatment and compensation so in order to uh, improve the situation we need some strategies building voice capacity and empowering the workers act and activists to fight for safe and decent working condition promote the participation oriented safety improvement training initiative and actions at national and uh, regional level uh, and organize occupational accident victims to ensuring they are able to represent themselves in decision making process that voice their rights and well being also linking the ohs movement nationally and regionally through various existing platform and i can refer here the the good platform that already uh, is uh, right at the moment not exist the ilo cis that network which was the network for the all ohs organization globally sharing of information and and collective work that need to be restored for for collective action and also we have to covid 19 need to be classified as an occupational disease under the national regulatory framework with an official occupational disease reporting and reco recording requirements both for preventive reasons and for workers compensation so occupational health and safety should be given the status of fundamental rights at the international labor organization that is our demand and this is a long overdue measures which would give workers protection from death and disease and same priority as freedom of association collective bargaining and protection from discrimination forced labor or or child labor so it it should it it would save the life at work and we must do it now collectively thank you thank you very very much mr chaudhry and thank you again for reminding us of the important discussion currently taking place in the ilo about making safety and health a fundamental right and principle dr roy the, the one minute please the 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 last word is yours thank you uh thank you for having me here from this platform i uh, know now that we are having the same challenges throughout the kind of continent but the opportunities are we can work from to today all together and we can extend our cooperation and collaboration with uh, the our neighbor countries and i hope ilo would take us again and again in this kind of platform 
and where we can share we can get the knowledge about the about how other countries working on the uh, workers health safety and welfare so thank you all thank you lilo and that's it take care thank you so so much i i want to end this close uh, the session by saying by thanking you all i think what I found very encouraging is this idea, you know, this common purpose around safety and health. I think it's one of the topics that is collaborative in nature. It's one of the topics that brings stakeholders together. It was music to my ears to hear Mr. Chowdhury and Mr. Siddiqui talk about collective action. The, you know, it is, it is the model that the Vision Zero Fund follows because we really do recognize that everybody has a role to play in this. And so it was very, very good for me to hear. I was also very encouraged to hear you all say how much you've learned from each other, which is, I think, the purpose of a session like this. So we will definitely try to do more of these. I want to thank my colleagues in the Delhi office for, uh, for organizing this event. I want to thank you all for allowing me to moderate. Um, I wish you a, a very, very nice uh, rest of the day. Uh, stay safe, uh, stay healthy, uh, and thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.